Alice, Robin, thank you for your opening comments. I want to thank all of you who are joining us here today and all of you who are joining us on online as well. I'd just like to uh, um, add my appreciation to the support for the Commonwealth Fund, not only for this event and some of our related activities on trying to drive forward uh, effective ways of improving care from healthcare organizations within this country and around the world that are starting from very different places in terms of how they're delivering care and how they're paying for it, how they're making it sustainable, but also for that vision that uh, Robin described. Uh, the Commonwealth Fund has been working on this for a long time. We were just talking this morning before the event started about how uh, the world does seem to be changing, though. Uh, recognition that um, the, the traditional focus on health services is probably not enough, uh, that uh, to help healthcare providers work with patients in new ways to prevent complications of illnesses and uh, get care right the first time uh, requires new methods of financing and new methods of patient engagement that really nobody around the world has quite solved the way to address. And we do have uh, different philosophical approaches to the role of government uh, in, in healthcare delivery in different countries. We do have very different cultural starting points. But I think you'll see today uh, the, the, the degree to which uh, there are some common challenges and common ways to learn about experiences and addressing those challenges is, is actually pretty striking. Uh, so I do want to turn to that, but also want to give, uh, uh, spend a minute to, to thank the, the Merkin Family Foundation Foundation as well. As uh, Robin mentioned, their support for our efforts here uh, has been critical. It's come through the Richard Merkin Initiative on Payment Reform and Clinician Leadership, which has really been all about engaging clinicians in finding leading ways to not only think about reforming care in their own practices, but to be leaders in payment reforms that can be implemented at the, the local level, uh, uh, working with health plans, working at the, the state and national level to make these kinds of reforms in their practice more sustainable so that uh, uh, they really can make ends meet and deliver the kind of care that their patients would like to see. And all of this, uh, this, this initiative on, on clinician-led uh, health care reform, this uh, emphasis on some of the global opportunities uh, that are emerging for, for common progress on, uh, on uh, improving care and avoiding unnecessary costs, uh, all of this has come together in, in events like the one that we're doing this morning. Uh, by focusing on uh, diabetes. As you all know, diabetes is a major public health challenge that affects 10% of Americans, including our uh, uh, Center for Health Policy uh, director uh, here, uh, and nearly 350 million individuals worldwide. Uh, about one-fourth I'm sorry, one third of those individuals live in the countries that are represented here at this event in the case studies and reports that we'll be presenting today in India and in the United States in Mexico and in Spain, uh, there is a substantial, in fact, disproportionate burden uh, of diabetes facing the populations. These are countries that are in very different places in terms of where they are in development, in terms of uh, many other uh, uh, issues as well, uh, but it just highlights that the similar similarity of the underlying challenges facing uh, all uh, healthcare systems around the world today. And in all of these systems, you're going to hear about how some of the traditional ways of supporting health care, whether it's through uh, uh, publicly financed budgets for hospitals and, uh, and individual uh, clinics, or whether it's through fee-for-service medicine that's uh, focused on uh, traditional volume approaches to supporting health care, uh, what you're going to hear is that uh, these are not getting us to where we need to be in terms of addressing the, the, the risk factors for diabetes, identifying patients who have these risk factors these risk factors early, uh, helping them make changes in their diet, their lifestyle, uh, to better self-manage their condition, helping them use proven effective uh, medications uh, to get the diabetes under control, and helping them get coordinated and effective care from healthcare providers uh, when they need it. As you'll hear, and as you've probably seen in the case studies, uh, there are significant gaps all over the world uh, in dealing with these features of uh, uh, these uh, uh, important features of diabetes from the standpoint of screening uh, to ongoing behavioral management to effective use of medication uh, and dealing with the, the complications that, that can't be prevented. So there is an urgent global need for innovative care models 
for disruptive innovations that take advantage of new technologies both within healthcare and beyond healthcare uh, to change the way that uh, uh, care delivery works for this uh, very important condition. Uh, and along with that, a great need, as I think you'll see, for new ways of financing and supporting this kind of care uh, so that uh, clinicians can have an easier time of, of working together with their patients and maybe delivering care in new ways to get better outcomes and lower costs. You're also going to hear about new ways of engaging patients uh, to support reforms in care, uh, ways that rely on patients to make choices about what might be uh, the best care for them, uh, as in uh, some of the examples in, in India. Uh, for example, and how they can take steps to be more active and effective partners uh, in preventing uh, the disease complications. Now, these disruptions in care delivery mean shifting away from traditional ways of engaging patients, traditional ways of delivering care that might be provider-centric, to focus on much more patient-centered care, much more individualized care. Uh, these, uh, uh, these challenges, though, in implementing these kinds of reforms uh, are uh, being met in a number of ways around the world. And one of the questions that we want to uh, ask today and raise in our discussions is, is, uh, what can we really learn from each other? Since there does seem to be this sort of similar set of underlying challenges and uh, underlying opportunities for improving care, so there seem to be some really interesting and, and uh, promising ideas being implemented for both reforming care and supporting these kinds of disruptive innovations in healthcare delivery. Uh, how can we make more rapid progress together? How can we achieve some of those goals that Robin Osborne was mentioning earlier uh, in terms of getting getting to high-performing healthcare systems uh, all around the world. Uh, to do this, we're going to showcase five global case studies that are examples of efforts to disrupt diabetes care and address some of these challenges in uh, uh, care delivery and improving outcomes for this very important condition. Uh, we're going to hear from the Carlos Slim Foundation from Mexico, where they're supporting an innovative program, a disruptive program called Casa Lud. We're going to hear from Suga Vazvu Healthcare in India, rural India, uh, maybe not the place you think of for uh, innovative approaches to uh, uh, care delivery, uh, but it's happening there too. From Ribera Salud in Spain, which has uh, turned around a traditional healthcare financing model there to really increase the emphasis on uh, caring for patients with diabetes and other complex conditions more effectively. Theta Care Complex Care in Wisconsin uh, actually is taking some uh, similar steps to what we've, uh, uh, what we're hearing about in other places around the world, like Ribera Salud, and uh, the Rio Grande Valley ACO in South Texas, uh, implementing some uh, important new steps to uh, achieve these same goals. So a great diversity of uh, po patient populations, geographic locations, initial financing mechanisms and the like, but some very common challenges that uh, all of these organizations are seeking to address through disruptive innovation and supportive financing and policy changes. Uh, while we're focusing on diabetes care here and the, the lessons for uh, here in the United States and around the world, uh, I want to emphasize that as you'll hear from many of the participants that diabetes can be viewed as kind of a, a leading condition. Many of the initiatives that you're hearing about uh, today uh, focus on diabetes but also on other conditions as well, conditions that often go along with with uh, this uh, particular chronic condition uh, and conditions that can respond to the same kinds of reforms that you're going to hear about focusing on uh, diabetes care. And we're going to focus on both the reforms in care delivery and the reforms in payment and policy to make those disruptive innovations sustainable. Uh, hopefully, we're going to generate uh, quite a discussion here today in the room. And I want to again uh, call out to those of you who are joining us uh, online uh, that if you'd like to contribute to the discussion as well, it's hashtag uh, global health, and we'll try to get your comment uh, in the discussion too. So uh, with that, I'd like to move us right into our first panel and ask them to come on up uh, while uh, I'm, I'm uh, introducing them. And I start out by uh, introducing the moderator for this panel, my, uh, my good friend uh, Krishna Udaya Kumar, who's the head of global innovation at Duke Medicine. Uh, come on up. Uh, you got to get microphones on, so I'm going I'm I'm to cover the time here for just a minute. Um, 
uh, Krishna at uh, Duke Medicine is responsible for the development and implementation of global strategy as well as business development for Duke Medicine. Uh, through Duke Medicine Global, Krishna works closely with leaders across the medical center and really across the world to expand Duke's international activities and global partnerships across translational and clinical research, global health, education and training, healthcare delivery, healthcare management, and other areas. Um, I've gotten to know Krishna as well through his leadership as the executive director of the International Partnership for Innovation. Healthcare Delivery, which is a nonprofit organization affiliated with Duke Medicine that uh, uh, has had support from the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the global uh, the the, the um, uh, World Economic Forum and and other uh, uh, other uh, uh, international collaborations uh, to help innovators scale and replicate successful approaches to healthcare delivery solutions. There's a great wealth of experience and information there on disruptive innovation in healthcare, uh, IPIHD has worked with individuals from academia, industry, foundations, government to facilitate the growth of transformative models of care. And uh, I have to say, we've really enjoyed the partnership with them, emerging partnership with them here at Brookings, where our focus has been on policies that are intended to support exactly the kind of disruptive innovation that IPIHD has led. Um, I think uh, uh, Krishna is going to introduce the uh, rest of the leaders on the, the panel. Um, I would like to introduce all of you to uh, Elise, you have the time cards right there. Wave to Elise, uh, and uh, uh, and I'll uh, we'll, we'll get started right now. Thanks, Krishna. Great, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Alice and Robin, as well for your introductory remarks. I think you've set the context well. So, so why are we talking about diabetes today? You heard it; it's a huge health burden in its own right. 350 million people and, and growing rapidly, and beyond that, it represents the the archetype for non-communicable or chronic diseases more broadly. That uh, that threaten the viability of many health systems around the world, if not economies. So, so why innovation? I think uh, not just in the U.S., as we heard about from Robin, but in many places around the world, there's this idea that we're not deriving as much value as we could from our health systems, that, uh, that if we really could look at this uh, around the axis of cost, quality, and access, what some have called the triple aims, uh, and use that as a framework for talking about what the promise of innovation is that we could actually do better collectively. And then finally, why look around the world? We know that there are shared challenges. Many health systems look different from each other, that, but there are many principles that, that really are more alike than different. And not only that, not only do we have to learn from our challenges and mistakes, but there's, there's huge value in actually looking at where the bright spots are. So what is working? And, and we can learn from uh, anywhere in the world where we see models that are working. And so uh, over the next uh, hour or so, what uh, we want to do is, is dig a little deeper into some of the models that seem to be working and learn from what they've done and think about what we can generalize beyond that. So joining me this morning, we have uh, uh, a great panel. We have uh, Manuel Bosch, who's the deputy manager of Ribera Salud in Spain. Uh, we have Ricardo Mujica Rosales, who is the executive director of the Carlos Slim Institute in Mexico. And we have Zina Johar, who's the founder and CEO of Sugavarbu Healthcare in India. Uh, what I will do is ask each of them really to start uh, to by briefly describing what it is they do, what the innovation is, to give us context, and then go a little deeper. Uh, before I do so, uh, I'll point out, uh, as others have, uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So any comments or questions you have, please, along the way, uh, send them via Twitter to hashtag global health. Uh, and uh, we won't be able to touch on all the details this morning, but there are case studies of, of each of these available outside and online. So let me first uh, turn to Manuel. So tell us for uh, Ribera Salud and specifically the, uh, the chronic, uh, care, the complex care plan that, that you've developed there, what was the challenge that you sought out to address and, and what is the complex care plan? Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to express my gratitude for, for the invitation. It's a great opportunity for us to be here and to, to share our perspective with, with you. Well, let me uh, uh, a quick introduction about our health system and, and, and Rivera Salud because uh, you probably know we, we uh, Spanish, we have a great national health service. We're proud of it. It's cost free, it's universal access good outcomes, but of course it has some weaknesses, uh, the same as in the rest of the world, maybe. Will be, of course, growing budgets, growing uh, deficit, bureaucracy, 
and maybe, of course, you need some reforms. In this context, or reforms is where Rivera Salud uh, was born, I think it was 15 years ago. And uh, we are, a, we are a, what we call a healthcare integrate, integrated provider. And our model, uh, before explaining our chronic care plan, is based on mainly four tenets. The first one is PPP, private public partnership. We only work for the administration and with the government. The second one is capitated payment. Third one is integration between primary care and hospital or secondary care. And the fourth one is networking. Let me explain quickly capitated payment. I think it's the most important. Uh, well, as you probably know, uh, we as a private contractor, we received a fixed sum from the government. It's not a risk adjustment uh, fee, so we need to make uh, most worth of that, of that money. But in return, we are fully accountable of the health of a population. In our case, we are managing for, for uh, integrated health departments about 700,000 people in, in Valencia, in the region of Valencia. And we provide uh, those people primary care and uh, hospital, hospital care. Well, uh, capital payment is the first uh, important thing. Maybe the second important thing is integration model. Uh, for us, the most important is not the hospital. For us, the most important is not primary care, GPs. For us, the most important is not the patient, believe me. For us, the most important is the citizen. We want uh, capitated payment. We want uh, the people to be as healthy as possible because the healthier the population is, the more revenues the companies will gain. Okay. So to just bring all these things together, capitated payment, integration model, uh, and in order to keep people as healthy as possible, uh, we have developed what we call our Rivera Salud Clinical Management Model. It sounds very good. Uh, and uh, well, at a glance, uh, we work on, on a schema of uh, population health management with risk adjustment tools. We provide a specific uh, care with specific pathways for each individual patient. Uh, we have powerful IGs, so we can uh, somehow engage patients in their own health. We have a health portal, we have well-being programs, we have teaching uh, programs in order to change the way they like, the way they eat, the way they buy food. We have also school programs. Uh, we have a self-development incentive program to align uh, the, the work of our people between primary and hospital care. IT is okay with this thing, important role also of the nurses. They are leaders of some of our case management, for example, or dischargement area. And well, I think this is the, the, the great schema. And, and well, I think we can go on later with diabetes. Sure, thank you. Uh, it seems to have a lot of connected parts. Yep, thank you. So <laughs> how have you learned over time and evolved that model as you, as you understand each of the components of actually taking care of a population and especially around how it applies to chronic disease management with diabetes? Yes, uh, well, uh, for us, as, as I have said, uh, the most important thing is keeping people uh, healthy. So we, for example, we can, can show you one of the best of the brief experience we are managing in the south of Valencia, in Elche and Torrevieja, it's two small cities. We are there accountable of more or less 300,000 uh, people, and we are providing, this is the case uh, there, uh, we are providing their health. So, for example, we have developed there a, a full population uh, health management. We are using uh, ITs, we are using PRGs and other risk adjustment uh, models in order to target and to identify the name or the surname, the ID, the social conditions of the diabetic people there. We are also enrolling them in a specific, in a specific pathway, in a specific care pathway. Uh, and well, uh, also we have that at the end of the process, we have a uh, very, very, very important or very powerful IT uh, data analytic solution in order not only to measure cost, but also uh, quality outcomes and efficiency. Great, thank you. And we'll dig deeper in just a minute. 
Let me turn now to Zina. Uh, tell us about the challenge you saw in rural India, first that led to your developing of Sugavarbu and then how you evolved to this subscription care package model. Sure, I mean, that's a nice question, but I need two hours to explain this. <laughs> the two-minute version. <laughs> Okay, first of all, I would like to thank Mark and Andrea, you know, for giving us this opportunity and actually working so closely with us in developing the case study. I think the case study was a perfect build up to this session, and I think they really add up as great resources, and to you for that wonderful question. Um, so, you know, just as a context, our enterprise is based out of rural India, uh, practically a green field for organized healthcare. I mean, you have the unorganized sector, which is available over there, which are primarily local practitioners who are providing medicines. So when we started back in 2007, we wanted to create an enterprise, and we fought with our regular challenges of not having doctors, bringing in technology, bringing in some organization. And over the last five years, we, have, we touched around 70,000 70, patients who just came into our system, left, came into our system, and left. And when we actually started looking at who were these patients who were coming to us, you know, when you get started in India, when you read about diabetes, you almost are told, oh, that's a lifestyle disease, rural India, they're still back and beyond. These are not conditions that touch them. To our surprise, the prevalence of diabetes that we saw across different geographies in India were very comparable. The, the disease burden of diabetes in urban centers was very equivalent to the disease burden of diabetes that we saw in all of our geographies that we saw. So that myth was gone. And then we realized that we run a network of around nine clinics with you know facilities which are open from morning to evening. We do school programs, all of that. Patients came to us when they were sick, and then they kind of disappeared in thin air. And when we look at the kind of patients who come to us, 20 to 30% of patients were patients who were coming to us for chronic care management, you know, for getting their blood, blood values checked, for you know, getting their prescription if they didn't want to go to a hospital. And they came to us, and depending upon how seriously they took their chronic condition, they came to us for a month, two months, and then they all disappeared in thin air. And that's where we realized that you know, we are touching these patients, um, they are coming to us, but then we lose them in thin air. And why were we losing them in thin air? You know, they were even willing to pay for what we were asking them to pay. So money was important, wasn't a deal breaker there. What we felt was really missing in the system was accountability. I mean, who was really taking the ownership of the patient? The patient himself or herself, which they did for a short while, and then they get busy with their usual stuff. So as a healthcare provider, when we really wanted to provide community-centered care, our conceptualization of really taking patient ownership was to bundle all the services that a diabetic patient would require at the front end and actually then bring in advantages that they would cherish, whether it is cost advantage, which is giving them medications not at the selling price but at the cost price and letting go of a 40% margin, whether it is doing home visitations for people who are not showing up, whether it is keeping a blood profile for patients you know, who would need regular checks, whether it is really modulating your, you know, titrating the dose properly you know, to make sure that you are having the right amount of metformin you know, uh, when, you, when you get started. It's not only important that you have diabetes and you start popping a pill, but popping the right amount of pill is also as important. And those are the things that kind of led us to our thinking to say that we have around 10 to 15 percent of our population in the areas that we cater suffering from diabetes. How do I package and bundle services? Unfortunately, we don't bundle actually hospitalization or insulin dependent versions of it. So it is very, very basic and like literally the first, you know, one inch of care that would qualify. So it is really the first, sorry, the first touch point. But in that first touch point, the role of the physician, the role of the nurse, the role of the community, and actually taking a lot of ownership of the patient is what we have tried to do. We have around 200 to 250 families enrolled with us today as we speak. And as we work through, you know, we're looking at the lessons that we are learning, many challenges that we face, and how we can really, you know, make this as a core value proposition and move away from our episodic care of waiting for patients to show up and then they come, get some care, and then they walk away. I mean, that's a good model, but I think there are enough providers in the country doing that already. Thank you. Now, 
you're doing this entirely from the private sector. Correct. Which is a little different than the first model we heard about, which is really around selecting a population and, and a partnership between the public and private. So tell us about the, the challenges you see on the ground, uh, including the, the role of the public sector as you see it. Mm -hmm. um, so the biggest challenge that I would say uh, you know, when we are managing our patient population. So we actually have a relatively strong community focus and we use a lot of technology. So for example, we will go out with mobile phones and actually do basic survey for the entire population, including doing your, you know, fasting blood sugar values and, you know, doing your basic BP and body mass index to get a sense of, are you at risk? Should you be, you know, checking yourself up for an additional level of test? So we grade the population really well. And everything that I spoke about subscription care. So when we grade the population, people would understand, oh, I'm at high risk. Oh, you know what? You guys helped me diagnose my diabetes. So that's really great. But the ones who really sign up for our packages are the ones who really know they're suffering from diabetes, who are spending a significant amount of money already. And look at our value proposition, unfortunately, only as a cost-saving instrument. The ones who are early in the game or are at high risk, Continue to, oh, so I see the end things, you know, flashing on my <laughs> <Go> face. <ahead. laughs> Keep going. Um, but the ones who are like really early on in the profile, we are still struggling to convince them to start proactively managing their disease condition. They still like to watch. I mean, for in the private sector, when you're paying out of pocket, when I as a healthcare provider go and tell them, you know, by the way, you're at high risk and this and that, it's like, are you trying to make money of me? I don't feel any symptoms. You know, it is not impacting my productivity in any way. I feel perfectly healthy. You tell me my BMI is not right and my BP is shooting up, so I need to do something. I'm not completely convinced. The public sector on the other side has that leeway because they've been present in the geography for 60, 70 years uh, and they can do a lot of stuff for free. Um, you know, that they can actually really, you know, focus the ones who are at high risk and have a lot more focus on prevention than the private sector who really has to go with the diseased lot and then move downstream. So that, I, I would say, is our largest challenge. Thank you. And let, let's come back to that in just a few minutes. Uh, moving to Ricardo. So tell us a bit about you know, why diabetes is important to the Carlos Slim Institute and what led you to develop the Casalud support model. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, also, um, I would like to start by thanking uh, the, the Brookings Institute for this uh, uh, work, this collaboration where we have been working on for the past uh, months. Uh, it's been fantastic. Thank you to, to Mark, Andrea, uh, Monica, all, all the people here. Um, also, I would like to, to start a little bit on, on the context uh, with, with Mexico as in the other cases, um, uh, chronic diseases are that really big challenge for, for our country. Um, according to some measurements, we're the leading country with the highest rate of pre-obesity and obesity. Uh, we're definitely the, the highest, have the highest rate for infant uh, obesity in the world. Uh, also, diabetes is a, accordingly a, a big challenge. The official number, the official figure is 9% of the population has diabetes. Some studies show that it's up to 15% of the population has uh, diabetes. Uh, to treat uh, all of this, uh, we, we have to do it from, from, from the public sector. This is the, the highest outreach that we think we can work with. And uh, from the Carlos Bean Foundation, we have found a great partner with, uh, with the public health system. Um, I have to say also, it's a very fragmented system what we have in, in Mexico. Uh, we have different institutions working uh, in which the biggest one is uh, the Ministry of, of Health, where there are around 12,000 uh, primary health clinics. And I think that's the, the focal point. And the model that we have, de we have developed is uh, working around with uh, these uh, 12,000 uh, clinics. Uh, of course, the, the clinics, they provide uh, for free um, uh, meds and uh, lab tests, et cetera, but they do it in a, in a quite inefficient way uh, due to uh, inefficiencies, corruption, and, and so on. So that's one of the, of the key points that we have been trying to, to work with. Uh, the model we have uh, developed also is, uh, it uses different elements in, in prevention. 
we, we talk about a proactive prevention in the sense of going out and reaching for, for the people doing systematic screening and, and not only doing the screening but referring them to the, uh, to the health provider, to the clinics for proper treatment. Uh, we, we have developed uh, very strong uh, elements around uh, uh, technology. Uh, they, some of them are already available in, in industrialized nations, uh, but not so common for, for a context uh, as ours. And what we have done is develop all these elements uh, for uh, a, a local context, uh, completely not from scratch, learning about best practices, but uh, that they are adapted for, for the models that we, we, we need. Uh, the Casalud model is based on four uh, main pillars. Uh, again, the first one is doing proactive prevention. We have developed a very easy model in which you can do screening in less than 10 minutes for obesity, hypertension, diabetes, uh, in some cases also for kidney disease, uh, this dipidemia. Uh, et cetera, uh, to do it, uh, to, to assess the, the risk factor. Uh, the second one is evidence-based disease manager through technical systems, as I was mentioning, a set of uh, systems that are integrated in order to go from, uh, to have information outside the health clinics, refer the people to the health clinics, and do a continuous um, evaluation and, and a follow-up on what's the patient doing like. Um, we also introduced systems for drug monitoring and, and lab tests. Uh, this has a, a component that's very important for us, that's transparency and accountability. Uh, given that the public health uh, system, what, how it works is that they, uh, they have a per capita endowment for, for the patients they should be treating, uh, but then there's no accountability on, on if the, actually the patients receive the the, the lab tests and the medicines and, 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 and so on. And the fourth element has to do also with continued uh, medical education. That's not only for, uh, for doctors, but for the whole team. Uh, it's online education that's very practical, very operational, uh, that will go from the administrative team all the way to the specialists uh, so that everyone can, can, can know what is it that they should be uh, doing. The initial model, we started working with it uh, about seven, eight years ago. Uh, we did uh, various pilots around the country with different states. And um, starting in 2013, the government launched what is called the National Strategy Against Diabetes and Obesity. Um, it has different components around that that has to do uh, with regulation, effective uh, healthcare, preventive strategies, also education. And we are part as a foundation of this national strategy. We help develop all the indicators, uh, develop some ideas on how treatment should be uh, started. And uh, we, uh, on the operational side, the model is being implemented uh, in a number of health clinics. We call them um, excellence, diabetes networks of excellence. And it, we're putting together at least one network per state, per one of the 32 states in, in Mexico. So far, we're, we're here operating uh, networks in 20 of the 32 states. Uh, we're developing six more, so we're mostly covering all, all the country. Through this network's uh, uh, a population of around 1.3 million people are, are, are served. And all this information, it's integrated into a dashboard where you can follow up on how things are, are, are moving and have our accountability. Uh, I'll leave it to, to this point for now. Great, thank you. And, and so all of you talked about this idea of, of measuring, evolving accountability in some sense. So tell, let's take a bit deeper dive into that. And maybe I'll, I'll start with you. And uh, so what do you measure? And what, would, what is success for you? And how do you, what, uh, how do you continue to evolve your model as you see challenges? Uh, the way we're measuring it, it it's uh, done in, I would say, in three phases at this point. Uh, number one, it's the implementation of the models, uh, doing risk assessment 
each clinic has to have a, a goal set of goals of people they have to screen for outside of the of the health clinics in order to, to see the risk. Um, the, the second part would be to start having people that were detected get treated in the in the clinics. And the third one would be the outcomes. Uh, if you find someone with uh, diabetes, or hypertension, et cetera, uh, to have uh, their indicators controlled, and especially for the, the preconditions, uh, to get them back into a steady state or even into a healthier state. Now, um, what we found is uh, treating a pre-diabetic versus treating a diabetic, it's 30 times lower oh, in, in, the, in the case of Mexico. So it makes a lot of sense from a cost side for the, for the government. And, and where are you in terms of impacting outcomes with this model? Um, what you can see in the board, it's, it's really nice because what we're comparing is all these networks that we're working with with a set of uh, clinics outside of the networks. And we've, we've seen uh, already some results. You know, uh, the, for instance, um, having diabetes, the, the glucose levels controlled, outside of the clinics, uh, what you're seeing is around 15, 20%. In these networks, it's, it's going up to 30, 35%. And so we're seeing initial results for this. Great, so Zena. What do you measure for success and what have the challenges been? Uh, well, you know, so there are different levels. So, for example, if you are a diabetic patient who's enrolled with us, so level one is, are you complying with all the visits? So as per our package, you know, we have almost a chart that is given to you saying that you need to show up, you know, twice a month to our clinic. These are the medications that you need to take. These are the values that we will track for you. So level one is, are you doing what you're, what you're expected to do? You know, are you really complying to the chart that we gave you? Um, level two is clinical outcomes to say, how are your values performing? Whether we're looking at blood pressure, whether we're looking at fasting glucose values, you would like to introduce parameters like HbA1c and all of that, but we literally pra practice in the middle of nowhere. So we are figuring out of ways in which we can really introduce these tests as well. Uh, level three, which is primarily the litmus test for us, is to say, do these guys re-enroll with us? And is the enrollment percentage going up? Are we having new enrollments? And are the ones who enroll with us coming back? That's really the litmus test for us. Because if they don't, because we're talking really about out-of-pocket expenditure over here, and if they don't, if they're not willing to part with their own money, clearly they're not seeing any value in what we are providing. And if we see a higher enrollment from the populations where they come from, clearly the word of mouth is working and people are beginning to see a value. Are there any larger population level outcomes that we've managed as of today? I would say we are very early to start talking about population level outcomes. Okay, sure, fair enough. And well, that's a great question, yes, because I think we, we measure almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for example, we can measure, we are now measure how many patients we have in our different clinical groups no? and how they move no? from severity to, to more severe. We also have some KPAs related with the process, how many patients are enrolled in health programs, how many patients are using IT tools, the health portal, and of course we have a, an, an opinion on powerful IT solution to, to monitor outcomes, clinical outcomes, uh, costs. We, we prefer not to talk about costs, we prefer to talk about uh, utilization of the, of the resource or capacity. And uh, uh, of course we are now working also in that kind of, we say that, that outcomes that patients to, that, sorry, that the outcomes that really matters to, to patients. This new step, this new standards. The three models we have, yours is probably represents the most comprehensive approach as, as a single provider. So what impact have you seen specifically around diabetes? Well, we have some outcomes in, in our departments in, in Elche and in Torrevieja in the south of, of Valencia. Uh, we have there measured costs and admissions. And for example, uh, we have compared our admissions, uh, the, the utilization of hospital resources Comparing Rivera Salud, uh, OICD, and USA, and for example, we have 
50% less diabetes, long-term complication hospital admissions than here in the USA and same with the OECD. We have 13 less lower extremity amputation than OCD and nearly 60% less than here in the USA. And in, and in terms of cost, just only one minute, uh, the mainly area of cost allocation for us is outpatient. Uh, we treat diabetes in primary care with nurses, with GPs, and we try these patients not to arrive to the hospital. And here in the USA, I think, the reports of the American Diabetes Association, the <coughs> most of the main area of cost are uh, hospitals. Thank you. So, so impressive outcomes, then, that, and you're able to track everything, which is <laughs> even better. <laughs> so let me turn to what I think a theme that all of you touched upon, um, which is this idea of putting the patient or consumer at the center, which uh, doesn't always happen in, in many health systems. and. Uh, why has that been an important part and how has it contributed to your success and, and how do you have accountability to the patient or the consumer in the models that, that you're developing? Sina, you spoke a bit about you know, looking at re-enrollment. Anything you'd want to add to that about how you're really uh, putting the patient-centric nature uh, at, the, at the core of your business? Well, I, I feel you're drifting a little bit away from a fact saying you'll ask easy questions. <laughs> I see them getting more like, okay, sure. <laughs> going to ask this in Spanish. Right? <laughs> um, so talking about, uh, you know, keeping patient at the core, you know, uh, if you look at India, India is a little bit different in terms of context as compared to every other country. You know, if you look at spending, we spend close to 5% of a GDP on healthcare. And unfortunately, of that 5%, less than 1% comes from the, you know, government. Everything else is out of pocket, which means literally every individual in India shops for healthcare. And when you're shopping for healthcare, that's almost always irrational shopping. I'm sitting next to a physician, I'm sure he'll not sing. Of course, you guys know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, why keeping the patient is really, uh, keeping the patient in the center is really important for us is to say that we need to echo the requirement of a patient. And when you're looking for, uh, you know, the requirement of a patient, and let's look at a diabetes patient in our geographies, access is something that really means a lot to them uh, because most of the populations that we are talking about, you know, are really traveling quite a bit to seek their, uh, you know, healthcare services. Now, when a rural patient or a rural or a villager in India travels, he almost loses one full day, two hours of traveling, waiting in the doctor's office, coming back, that's one day of wage loss for that person. That's because we are not talking about families who have incomes which are all predefined and you know, they all have uh, you know, fixed salaries. They're almost all on daily income, other than the 20% who have access to good resources. So the opportunity cost and the indirect cost of seeking healthcare in our populations is really high. So a value proposition which does not give them only a direct cost saving, but really dramatically brings down indirect cost is huge for them. Mm. When you have an open heart surgery, the indirect cost is reasonable as compared to uh, you know, your direct cost. But when you're going for just your you know, blood values being checked and for a refill of medication, the indirect and direct costs are actually comparable. They're 50% indirect and 50% direct cost. So over here, you know, how do you really bundle is to say that I'm not only helping you bring this down, but I'm literally collapsing this for you. And that is something that a patient truly echoes, you know, to say that, okay, access is something I, you know, understand. Mm. The other thing is to talk about quality. Now, quality is very wishy-washy because, you know, when you are talking about quality from the lens of a consumer or a lens of a patient, how, at least I'm talking about an Indian patient, how Indian patients perceive quality is how quickly can they come back on their feet. Quality is not about, you know, taking your time to get well. And for example, this is the biggest challenge that we have. Uh, you know, if we feel that the patient needs antibiotics, to not start them on broad spectrum, but maybe start with an amoxicillin kind of a simple uh, antibiotic. And these are really tough cells because 
most of these people or most of the populations that we serve have gone antibiotic resistance because, I mean, the pharmacy regulation in our country is kind of slightly wishy-washy, so you can get access to any medication that you want anywhere. So if you guys need medication, tell me I can get it for you next time. Your secondary business. <laughs> Social enterprises are tough to run. <laughs> So, so because of that, you know, now sitting in this audience, we would say, yes, being compliant to protocols is very important. You know, we should start with, you know, proactive care and we should start with preventive care. Almost nothing works because when you're serving a rural patient, he wants an injection. He wants either a steroid or a broad spectrum antibiotic so that he can flip back into action day two. And that's where we kind of almost constantly lose the battle on quality. So you can make a case on access. You can make a case on cost saving. On quality, as a private care provider, if ethics are on your side, it's really tough. If you let go of ethics, you're a very profitable venture, but then you never join IPIHD. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah. I think those are kind of the battles from the private sector. If you're the government, then you can really be on the high chair and have a slightly different approach. But as a private sector provider, you almost have these forces fighting against you all the time. Thank you. I think that's great insight from, from being active on the ground that's not visible to a lot of people that work just at a system or policy level. So, so Ricardo, how do you ensure that Casa Lude and all the clinics that you work with really become more patient-centric in their work? Um, to us, uh, again, it's, it's a, a really um, easy answer in the, in the sense that you, you have to do it a, as a patient-centered and, uh, center and, and look for accountability. And that's one of the, again, that, that, that's a key uh, element that we're looking for uh, here on uh, by working also with the, with the government besides the outreach and of course the, the, the health of the patient and it's not only the patient it has to be as in the case of, uh, of, the, of the Spanish case uh, we're looking about the general population oh it's better to have healthy citizens than, than, than patients um, the dashboard that I was talking about, uh, it's public. Anyone can get online on it. You know? So that's, uh, we think, that a game changer on how you can do things. Uh, what we're doing there is you have different set of indicators in which uh, you can compare how each clinic is, is doing on the goals that they, they set. So anyone can get uh, there, see which one's going, which, which one's doing better and then uh, you have accountability and you give the patients a, a voice and, and the citizens a voice. Also it's important to say um, in, in Mexico we have uh, the, the National Health Council uh, where every quarter all the ministers from, the, from the, all the 32 states and the federal authorities they sit, they go through a number of, of, of elements and they, they do uh, all the the planning for the health system, and we are able to go there in each each one of these meetings, and we show what how things are looking at on the on the dashboard and how things are moving along. So that's a very powerful incentive in in the sense that no one wants to see uh, no no state wants to to be seen in the bottom you know, of, of of their indicators. So that's a way to move things. Uh, around and, and create incentives to have a, a model that's sustainable and that they have to be reaching, uh, achieving their goals. Thank you, so, so transparency and, and benchmarking is key aspects of that work. Okay, uh, well, for us, uh, important thing is when we place the patient just in the, or the citizen in the center of the system, uh, I'd like to say that for us, patient is too late. We prefer to, to, to speak about citizens because placing them in the right place means that we need to treat that people at the right moment, at the right place, at the right risk. And that means that we, all of our organization, are just patient-centered. We have alignment of incentives and, 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 and there in Spain, we do not have a problem of underutilization of the services. We have a problem of overutilization. So, so our, our way of, of, of increasing loyalty to patients is just leading them through the right process in order that they can be treated in the better way possible. Thank you. Let's see if we have a few minutes to go to the audience. And we have, please put your hand up. I think we'll have a mic coming around. 
you could state your name, your organization, and a very brief question. Zafar Iqbal, Veterans Health Administration. My question relates to Indian background that you have competing uh, Ayurvedic system, Unani system, homeopathic system. So how you, uh, do you include them in your process or you compete with them all the time? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because that's one of our core innovations. So where we actually practice, um, we have practically no doctors. So as a country, just to set the context, we need around 1.2 million doctors. Uh, and we have close to 400,000 doctors. So at these 400,000 doctors like to practice in big cities because it makes no sense for them, uh, either in terms of compensation, career path, or you know, further education, to go to places where we are asking them to go. So we actually work with Ayurvedic and Siddha doctors and train them for like six months on the nurse practitioner curriculum that exists over here. So that's actually our core innovation, which I didn't speak about. Um, you know, which is the amalgamation of many of the resources that are existing in our country to practices that have worked very well in the West and actually find a mid path. We would have loved to take the nurse practitioner model to India, but the regulation is such we couldn't go very far. But this was a great opportunity, which is to look at Indian streams of medicine, bring in the nurse practitioner model over there, and actually you know, bring in kind of the best practice. It is very hard to bring best practices from Ayurveda and actually implement them because on, on one hand, when you talk about modern medicine, there is just a lot of research that supports that evidence. We have very little evidence uh, on the other hand. But whatever we can gather, we do actually bring those best practices. And the practitioner at the core is an Ayurvedic practitioner who's running our clinics because we, don't, we have no access to uh, allopathic doctors in our geographies. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, my name is Pamela Anderson. I'm from Johnson & Johnson in their diabetes care franchise. And the question that I'm wondering is, is there any common gaps? I'm hearing about <clears throat> citizens and patients. I'm hearing about how the rural, rural areas, it's very difficult to get practitioners. And I'm trying to understand what we can do to serve the patient or the citizen or whoever better and how we can meet those gaps. So anybody want to take that? So, so maybe I'll, I'll add to that and say, as you think about next steps, right? So you've, you've all achieved some effectiveness, some outcomes at, at what you're doing. So as you think about scaling and increasing the impact of your work, what are the, the key gaps? And, and what are you seeing as the necessary components to continue to scale? Please. Well, uh, in my opinion, we are working on, on that now. One of the most important gap is uh, working not only in a reactive way, but in a predictive way. We are working in our system, our ITs, in order to uh, target those patients who in the next years are going to be high uh, level or high users of the, of the system because we know that, for example, uh, we have underdiagnosis of some of the diabetes. Uh, we have patients that are uh, between 65 and 70 years and we know that now they are more or less healthy but in the next years they are going to be severe. So we are trying to improve that targeting in order to provide better processes, better health uh, alignment and also in order to teach them uh, to take care of their, of their health. Um, I, I would say in our case, being so uh, one of the key elements also the use of technology, uh, that's always a challenge, the, the uptake. Uh, we've conducted different evaluations and, and work with different partners. Actually with J&J, uh, &J, we have done some evaluations in, in Mexico on the use on cell phones, apps uh, as a follow-up. We've worked also with, uh, in, in the NCD partnership with Lily on how uh, the patients, uh, what is it that they are doing after they go into to the, to the health clinics and when they, what they have to do in order to change their, their behavior. I mean, and that's the biggest challenge and no one has, I think, the, the answer there. No, uh, this is something uh, as opposed to, to what you do with vaccines, that's a one shot. and. 
but with NCDs, it's a lifelong uh, thing that you have to work with. So you always have to come up with innovations and see what is it that's, that's working. Some things uh, have proven uh, results, but I think that's the biggest question mark. Um, I think in my case, I would just want to actually echo what the other panelists also said that, you know, when we are talking about diabetes, we actually are very proactive. So we will go out with mobile phones, get a sense of our geography, who's at high risk and, you know, who's at medium risk. But primarily where we are operating right now as a healthcare provider is in the known known space, meaning people knew they had diabetes. We helped them actually with a low cost solution closer to their home. What will be success for us in a couple of years is if we could move from known known to the unknown known space, which means people did not know that they were suffering from a disease. Uh, through better testing, through low-cost diagnostics, we actually increased the capability of a population to really understand the true, true disease burden and begin to act on the disease burden through interventions like ours. We are a couple of years away from that, and that will be success for us and our journey over the next yeah. couple of years. Robert Ratner from the American Diabetes Association. The patient-centered approach here is still being looked at from an acute disease process, not a chronic disease process. So the comment that was just made about what the patient wants is to go back to work tomorrow and be functional. That's an acute care model, not a chronic disease model. My question to you is how do you adapt to a disease where acutely they feel fine, chronically they're gonna cost you money and it's going to be a major medical problem. One of the critical challenges to all of these models and certainly to almost any health system, anybody wanna talk about any experiences or challenges you've seen in this? I mean, uh, to us, that's a really good question. I wish I had an honest on answer to that one, but, but we, I would say, are like really struggling. So what we can really promise as a healthcare provider today is that clinically your condition is stable, but when complications arise, currently if you look at our model, even from the financing side of it, that's a little bit of an open end. You know, we expect for the public systems to kick in to be able to deal with those complications. We are hoping that we can delay the onset, but they continue to be a huge cost on the system. And you know they continue to actually backfire in ways you would not want them to backfire. In, in years to come, we are hoping that our model will become a little bit more comprehensive. But right now, we, that question is still on the wall for us. So we unfortunately don't have an answer to that one. Well, uh, nothing, nothing. Uh, well, I think that, that for us in Rivera Salud, uh, we, we match diabetes you know, as a chronic care we are our GPs that and our nurses. But I, I completely agree that this great challenge we have. We also trying to now we are trying to to for reports in our dashboard. So these new kinds of outcomes no that, that really matters to, to patients, but it's, it's a great it's a great challenge. And I'm gonna go back out in just a minute. Let me follow up on you know you mentioned financing and, and part of the, the work we're talking about is really uh, thinking about policy and financing and the broader ecosystem. So uh, for each of your models, what are the policies or financing mechanisms that have helped or that have hindered the effectiveness and scaling of your models? So let's start there and come. For us, I think that capitated payment is one of the most uh, important thing that can or that helps us to provide this kind of health or this kind of management. More so that it's somehow aligns all the stakeholders involved in the, the healthcare, the patient who wants to be as healthy as possible, the administrations that really wants to pay as little as possible, and of course the, the companies that want to have a good schema with a long-term contract. Thank you. Yeah, in our case, we see it uh, more as a problem of, of efficiency. Uh, before we had uh, Seguro Popular in Mexico, uh, probably it was around 5% of the GDP went for to health. Now it goes up to 6 to 6, 3%. Now, 
Now that we have more money, I think uh, we're doing, a, 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 instead of a better job, a, a worse job uh, from, from <laughs> the public side. Uh, so I think it's a matter of doing more, uh, better use of the resources. And again, uh, this comes back to the accountability and transparency issue. Uh, we think that if, if the governments are not accountable for the use of these resources, then nothing will work. And, and you can go up all the way up to the standards of the U.S. of around 10% or more, and still things will be as problematic as they are. So for us, it's just doing a, a better job with the resources that you have. India is at a very interesting point. So as I mentioned that India spends less than 1% of uh, its GDP, I mean, is spent by the government. Now, um, traditionally, I mean, when we got our independence around 60, 65 years ago, uh, you know, the government said that when we are spending this money, we want to send, spend all of this money ourselves, and we want to create all the infrastructure, and we want to be providing health care to our citizens. Thankfully, a decade ago, the government kind of woke up saying that they're very good in setting infrastructure, they're not the best players to provide services. And then, you know, as a country, we started looking at a lot of insurance. So in India, financing is understood as insurance. There is no other format in which we understand, uh, unfortunately, financing. So financing for us is insurance. So the, uh, you know, Indian government woke up to say that, you know, there are very interesting ways in which we can look at insurance-driven models in which the private sector participates with the government to provide health care to places where the Indian government is struggling as of today. As a country, we have around 15%, one five, of a population covered by any form of insurance, sponsored by the state, for, sponsored by the federal government, sponsored by the central uh, you know, employee union and all of that stuff, out of which only 5% is pure private insurance. So insurance is like a really super small market mm -hmm. in our country. And if you look at insurance, you know, most of that insurance is actually all hospitalization, which means you have to be in a hospital for a minimum of 24 hours before any kind of reimbursement kicks in. Uh, and the insurance companies realize that, you know, for them to be able to really keep a tight control on costs, they have to start looking at primary care, they have to start looking at chronic care management, but that's very different from paying for, say, a heart surgery, which is one episode, costs 100,000 Indian rupees, you can put in checks and balances. A diabetic patient will show up in a clinic three times, will cost $2 every time. It takes $4 for an insurance company to process that claim, so the math is not adding up for them. So in India, it is actually really good times to try out all of this financing uh, you know, methodologies, whether you're talking about subscription, capitation, primary care, acute management of chronic conditions, because we are all looking for ways to actually get a little bit broader than what we are doing today. So it's really interesting times with everybody looking for an answer. So in a couple of years, the follow-up that you will organize, I think we'll have <laughs> nicer <laughs> answers to present. But it's interesting times for sure. Oh, thank you all. And, and I think uh, we could keep going for a few more hours. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time <laughs> for this panel. And, and I think what you've heard about are, are three really interesting models and in very different ecosystems, very different approaches, but a lot of common themes, a lot of common challenges as they look at effectiveness, as they start using data in a continuous improvement perspective, and, and as they continue to interact with the policy and financing um, broader ecosystem to, to make sure they can continue to scale their impact. So please join me in thanking our panel for a fantastic conversation. <laughs>